Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We're thankful to be back in the service again tonight. We're glad to see each one that's here. We're going to begin reading in verse 10. Romans chapter 3. Verse 10, while you're finding your place, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day and for the blessings of it, Lord. I thank you for the many things you've done for us. I thank you, Lord, for the blessings of life that you've given us. I pray, Lord, that you would help me tonight to deliver the word you've put on my heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless this church and each one that's here. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would bless... Uh, even in the hearts of those that are lost, that you'd show them their need of Jesus while there's time and opportunity. And I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. Blessing the requests that were mentioned, Lord. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. I'm going to stop there in verse 19. Let me ask you a question right to begin with. Does that talk about you? Is that talking about you? You should consider that for a moment. Before I get to the idea, I want to, I, I want to talk about a doctrine tonight. And uh, I think this is kind of one, one of the main pieces of Scripture that uphold this. Although there's, the Bible's just uh, filled with this idea, so it's not a very difficult uh, doctrine to, to set out. There's not one that's going to be uh, unfamiliar to you. Uh, but doctrines in the Bible are extremely important. Uh, we talk about Jesus, and Jesus in, in the Word of God are used in, interchangeably in the Scripture. Jesus is spoken of as the foundation. The Word of God is also the foundation. And so the doctrines of the Scripture are the foundation uh, of ourselves. There's no other foundation that a man can have. If, if a man's not building upon the Word of God, he's not building on a foundation at all. In fact, he's building without one and without a foundation. The storms of life are going to completely destroy a man. And so the doctrines uh, of the Bible are, are, are important and they are the foundation. Think of them as being the foundation of our thought. They are the foundation of what we think. They are the foundation of what we believe. And what we believe uh, determines what we do. Uh, James speaks of, James chapter 2 speaks of uh, the works that we do. He said, you show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. James there is, uh, he's not, I'm careful how I say this, James is not serious in the sense of, uh, making the statement that you show me your faith without your works because it's, it's an impossibility that something that can't be done. You can't show somebody works without faith because our works reflect what we believe. The things that we do reflect the faith that we have or rather the faith that we lack in some situations and in some cases. And so what we believe are the, 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 the doctrines that we understand to be true are the very foundation of our thoughts and the very foundation of our decisions. You know, the idea of a worldview is going to de de determine how a person lives their life. If a person lives their life, or rather, if a person believes that there is no God, uh, 
then it's going to affect how he lives. It's going to affect the decisions that he makes. And so when we look at mankind, and the idea of mankind, we, we ask a few questions concerning this. We say, well, what's true concerning this? And when you look across the world at mankind, and you look at the people that are, that are not just around us, but we look at the entirety of the world and mankind, is, is man predominantly good? Are we good people? Is, is the majority of people good? I think it's an important question and one that we, we've got to ask ourselves. Is mankind, a, are, are we good? There's a few things that we need to, to look at. Uh, and when, you know, before we make that decision, before we say, you know, one way or another, before we answer the question of, of whether or not man is good, uh, is, I, I think, you know, there's maybe some things that we need to address beforehand when we're looking at that question. You know, what the world typically will say, and you talk to uh, philosophers and psychologists, and what they're going to tell you is that there's, you know, basically, basically this... Uh, group of people that are that are predominantly good and and that is going to be the majority when you're looking at kind of the bell curve of things and then on either end of the the curve you've got these outliers that that you know there's there's where your issues are going to be and that's where your your problems are going to be now these on the outside that's that's going to be the ones that are probably not very good but all of those that fall within the curve they're going to be, you know, for the most part, they're going to be good people. What does that mean? And what are we basing that decision on? Let's put it, let's put it this way. If you were to take a man and put him in complete isolation, and he's unaffected, he's unaffected by those things that are around him, he's unaffected by other people's sin, he's, un, he's unaffected by... Uh, the, the, the upbringing and the mistakes and all of that, that that go on around him, and you put him in and, and raise that man in complete isolation, and you raise him in a perfect environment, then what's that man going to turn out to be? Good or bad? Well, I think the Bible answers that question for us because it's actually been done. That was the exact case that Adam was in, right? And so Adam, is, you look at the nature of Adam, and it, we, we all have the same nature. Peter mentions a statement. He says that, you know, just in my own words, I think it's 2 Peter chapter 2 at the very end of the chapter, if you want to write that down and go back and look at it. But Peter's making the case there that you can take a man and, and take, it, the, the, take him out of the pollutions of the world. That's the word he uses is pollutions. Well, pollutions are the things that are from the outside in. It's the things that affect me from the outward. It, 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 it's, you know, the things that are coming in outwardly. He goes on to say you can never take him out of the corruption. That's because corruption is from within. And although you can remove me and maybe take away the pollution that's around, he can never take me out of the corruption that's in my own heart. And so man, what he's saying here is corrupt at his core. And that there's a corruption in man that is there that we must be aware of. And so when we look at the doctrine of man, and we're going to get into some, some things here in a moment, but when we look at the, 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 the doctrine of man, you see what Paul's saying here in Romans, and even what Peter would say there in 2 Peter chapter 2, that man's corrupt, even as Paul would say here, that, that, that there is none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. No man. And so if you take a man and you take him out of the pollution of the world and you put him in an environment where he's right by himself, is he going to seek after God? No, he's not. Because there's none that seeketh after God. And so I say, you know, is there, would, he, would he stay in the way? Would he stay in the straight path? Well, no, they, they've all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. Man's not going, it's not going to do, accomplish. He's not going to bring any profit. He's not going to do good by himself. 
No man's going to accomplish anything. And this is describing who we are without Christ. This is our nature apart from Jesus Christ. And so man is, is not good. He's corrupt, and in fact, there's nothing good in him. And if you want to look at how far and how far-reaching that goes, you know, I kind of think of the statement that made in Scripture about the righteousness of man is as filthy rags. And, you know, we kind of get the idea that, you know, maybe it's dirty and, and all of that, and, and, and that, but there's, you know, there's some righteousness there. And there is no righteousness in man at all. And so if we were to take a man and we were to look at the righteousness of all of humanity together, there's nothing. There's none. We are not righteous. There is no righteousness in us. There is none. And that's what Paul's saying here. There's none that doeth any, any good. None. Why is that important? Why is that important? What we believe about man affects how we deal with man. Not only in what we see in others, but how we deal with ourselves. And so tonight, what I want to do is I want to kind of give you maybe three things that this idea affects. And there are, I'm sure, plenty of others that we could talk about and, and would mention and, and, and be important as well. But these are the three things that are on my heart for tonight. You look at the idea of, of salvation for a moment. Do we need to be saved? Well, that depends on our view. If we, when you ask somebody whether or not they need to be saved, well, that depends on their view of of humanity, it depends on their doctrine of man that, that's in their head. That's, you know, you, you may ask somebody that, and you say, well, they've got no concept of the doctrine of man. Well, they've got something that they believe about mankind. There's something that's there because these, we, we all have these thoughts. This is something that we come up with. And either you believe man is pretty well good at heart or, or that he's not. And so if you do believe that man is pretty well good at heart, if, if you believe yourself, if you believe that, that men are, for the most part, man's good, then I've never ran into anybody that believes that man is, for the most part, good, and yet believe themselves to not be a good person. In other words, that if you believe man to be good, then you also believe yourself to be good. Because nobody believes that man's good, but they're bad. Everybody has a justification for the things that they've done. Everybody believes. You can go talk to men in prison. You believe good. Yeah, I'm good. I just got caught up in a bad situation, you know. Or I'm innocent, you know. It wasn't my fault. Nobody accepts the responsibility of things. And, you know, that's kind of where we're at in, in some of these issues. And so you believe, ask a person, do you need to be saved? Well... Do you understand the fact that you need to be saved? And a person being able to comprehend the fact that they need to be saved goes back to the idea of what they believe about man. And so that's why sometimes the spreading of the gospel can be uh, very offensive. Is because before you can get to a person to, to, or get a person to understand that they need to be saved, they first have to see that they're lost, that there's nothing good in them, and they need Jesus Christ to save them. And it can be offensive when a person is believing themselves to be good and then you come in and begin to tear that down for them. No, you're not good, you know. Sometimes you talk to people about Christ and you ask them about their salvation, where they stand with the Lord. And I have had people tell me, I've had others, you know what, church, you know, I've never done anything to be saved from. And what they're saying essentially is that I've not done enough wrong to be lost. And they don't believe themselves to be. And so what are they, uh, that's, that, that, that in and itself is, is showing us that, that the, the very doctrine of man in their mind is wrong. 
That the reason that they feel that way is they, they see themselves as a pretty good people and probably see the world in that way as well. And, and never, never, you know, they've never done anything bad enough. And so they, it, it's flawed at the very core. So the Bible tells us, you know, to, to make straight paths for our feet. Well, can we do that by ourselves? Well, no, we can't. We try to make straight paths. And, and you can see it in humanity. You can see it in the nation of Israel and their nature. They try to make straight paths. But what we end up doing is we go one way or another. And the Pharisees, as hard as they tried to make straight their paths, erred on the side of pride and, and, and looking down at other people and despising others because they saw themselves as being better than other people. So we veer. And it's not just that Adam fell, and, and we all sinners just because Adam fell, but if you go back to, to, to chapter 5 when he's making that statement there in the book of, uh, of Romans, he's talking about us being and having descended from Adam. What he's telling us there is not only have we inherited the nature of Adam and we're sinners because of what Adam has done for us, or, or rather what Adam has done in the garden, and, and we all have inherited that sinful nature from him, but he says that we have all sinned. So he says in verse 12 in chapter 5, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. Because of one sin, death passed upon all men. But read the last statement in, chapter, in verse 12 there. For that all have sinned. For that all have sinned. We've all fallen. We've all come short. We've all sinned. We've all made mistakes. And so it's important for us to understand the doctrine of man that we could teach others. You know, others are kind of struggling, maybe struggling with the idea of God. There's a lot of people in the world today that are struggling with God. And not struggling with the God in the, in the idea of Jacob wrestling God there in the wilderness, but the idea of struggling in the notion of whether there's a God or not, because there's a part of every man who really desires there to be no God. There's, and that's in all of us. We, there's a part of us that desires that to be the case. Why? It may ask. Because we want to be our own God. We want to be the ones that call the shots. We don't want to look to judgment one day and say, well, I've got to answer for these things. I've got, I, I've got to one day meet God in judgment and answer for all these things. What we would rather do is say, you know, I don't have to worry about that. And at least at this point, all of these things that I want to do, I can do. And I don't have to worry about this judgment. I can be the God of my life. And I don't have to worry about some uh, higher being than me uh, judging me one day for all of these things that I do. And so, there, there again, to go back to the idea of what we believe about man altogether. Not only does it affect about how we look at uh, ourselves, you talk about salvation, whether or not we need to be saved. And I believe there are a lot of people that struggle today. We mentioned this, this morning about running from the Lord. And there are a lot of per people who understand, they know their sinful condition, and they are running from the Lord, from, even, even in, in being saved. And there are a lot of people who are running from the Lord today, and not believing that they've done anything wrong to be saved. It's still running from the Lord. It's running from the idea, it's running from the truth, that you're a sinner, and without Christ you're going to hell. And you need to be saved. And so there are many people today who are running from the Lord in this very mindset. It's not just only about how you look at yourself when you talk about salvation. It affects how you look at others. If you, if you believe that others are predominantly good and, and all of this, and, you know, it, it, it affects how we share the gospel to people. It affects how we, you know, one of the things that I've noticed lately, and I, I, it, it, as I try to evangelize, 
is that everybody's saved. Everybody you talk to is saved. Everybody you ask them, where, what's, what's going on? You know, how is it with you and the Lord? Do you know Christ? Have you, have you, have you trusted Him? And I try to word it in such a way that to not even get to the point where, but immediately that's the first thing. I, yeah, I'm saved. I know where I'm, you know, I know where I'm going. It doesn't matter the, the circumstance. doesn't matter the fruit. But the thing is, you know, it, it, you may say, well, okay, I, you know, well, that's good. You just walk off and that's it. But I try, I, I try to dig a, a little bit deeper because I know how easy it is if you say, you know, it's kind of the idea. Well, if I say that I'm saved, then he's going to shut up and go on. And that happens, I'm sure. How do I know that? Because I know the nature of man. I know who man is. I know who I am. And anything to get this man to shut up and leave me alone and not bring up all these things that I've been burdened about anyway. And so I try to always dig a little bit deeper. What makes you think you're saved? One day when you stand before the Lord... Why in the world would he let you into heaven? It's not because of anything we've done. It's because of Christ. It's because of Jesus. And so what we believe about mankind affects, uh, affects rather not only how we see ourselves in, in, in being saved, but it's how we see others in spreading the gospel. Second thing that I want to mention to you is how we view ourselves not only before we're saved, but how we view ourselves in after we're saved. How do you, it affects, if you, if you believe the doctrine of man, if you believe this about, about the depravity of man and that we're rotten to the core and there's nothing good in us, well, then what, how do, how that affects, that's going to affect how we view ourselves after that we've been saved. So, you say, well, after you've been saved, is everything fixed? Everything you got to, well, partly. Partly. What do I mean by that? Partly. Well, yeah, I mean, everything's fixed between me and the Lord. I've, my soul is sealed to the day of, the, the, the day of redemption. I have nothing else to worry about as far as eternity goes. I'm saved. I've got that taken care of. And I'm going to be with the Lord for all eternity. But I've still got this old man to deal with. There's still this old heart in me that was there before I got saved. And this, the same old heart that was nothing good in that I just read and described in Romans chapter 3, apart from Jesus Christ, that heart, he, he, it's still there. Well, why is, it, why is that important? Uh, but, but, and the reason is, is we often get to the place that, that if, if we're not careful, we say, okay, well, I've gotten saved. Let's just go serve the Lord now. And we're going to go do all of these things. And there's really no reason for me to, to, to spend time in the Word or to spend time with the Lord. There's really no reason for me to get to know the Lord. I'm just going to now go do what He's asking us to do and try to live this life that He's asked us to live. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to find. You're going to find yourselves burn out and quit very, very shortly after. Because you're still trying to do and you're trying to make the old man righteous. And he's not. He's still flawed. And there's still nothing good in him. And so what I must do now is I, 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 I've, got to, I've got to put that man aside. And even baptism shows us, and one of the first things that we're to do is to, is to see and to understand that the man who was once alive is now dead, and I need to put him down. I need to bury him. And the only way that I can live for the Lord properly is to bury the old man. Why, why, why is, again, why is this important? What, what is it? Because when we have a proper view of who we are after we're saved, and we get up and look at ourselves in the mirror, and we're going to see our worst enemy. We're going to see a man that we cannot 
trust. I can't trust that heart. I can't trust what's in my heart. I can't trust it. And I want you today to make a note of that. Circle it and put a star by it. You can't trust what's in your heart. You can only trust what God puts on your heart. I've heard so many people make statements about things that they, well, I've been, you know, I was, it was on my heart. You know, it was on my heart to do, it was on my heart to divorce my husband. I think the Lord led me that way. No, the Lord did not put that there. The reason that's there is because you've got an evil heart. God's not going to lead us to do something contrary to His Word. And so we cannot trust our own heart. It's deceitful. And so we have to view ourselves from that perspective that every single day I've got to wake up and I've got to live with an old man that's going, that's tempted to sin. That's, his very nature is to do what he wants to do and defy God. His very nature is to walk away from God. He's flawed at the core. And every day I wake up with him. Every day I go to bed with him. And if I'm going to serve God, then I must grow in Christ and put that old man aside. But if we don't have a proper view of man, that's not going to be important to us. And so we must see ourselves today as untrustworthy, flawed at the core, and only and only through the power of Christ, only through the leadership, only through growing in Christ, can we continue to live a life that would be pleasing to God. I want to go to the third one that I believe is extremely important. And I want you to know that not only do I desire you, I desire your prayers in all of this that we've mentioned, but certainly in this area. Because of the reality of it. It shouldn't just a few how we view, how we affect, you know, how we look at others, how we look at ourselves in salvation, how we look at ourselves after salvation. But it affects every aspect of how we deal with men. And one of the greatest dealings we have with men is when God puts one of them in our responsibility. And we've got to try to raise that little fella. And how you and what you believe about man will affect how you try to raise him. Have you ever seen somebody that their kid didn't do anything wrong? It doesn't matter how it doesn't, it doesn't matter the situation, and they could probably they probably are one of the worst kids in the crowd, but their kid never did anything wrong. It's because they don't have the proper view. Of the doctrine of man. When God gives us a child, that child has the potential to become what? I mean, be, quite frankly, he's got the, the potential to be a, 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 one of the greatest missionaries that there's ever been. Well, he's got the potential to be one of the most awful human beings that you could think of. That potential is there in that child. And we must remember that. And the only way that child's going to become anything, that, anything good at all is if, it, 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 of course, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we must begin and begin early to instill in them Christ. And we must instill, that's why the scripture said, Proverbs 22, 6, that you make, uh, that, that, that you train a child in the way he should go. Why does it say, why, why, didn't, why didn't Solomon tell us to train a child in the way he would go? Well, what, what way would a child go? If we, a child could go any way that he wanted to, which way would he go? The right way or the wrong way? Well, there again, you go back to what we believe. We understand that if a child is left to himself, even the Scripture tells us that a child left to himself would bring his mother to a shame. 
That you can't take a child and leave him alone. You can't take a child and, and let him raise himself. You've got, you got to steer him. You've got to teach him in the way. You've got to show him the truth. You've got to continually teach him the truth. truth. You've got to show him the way of Christ. You've got to show him the things that are important in life. You've got to raise him and show him to Jesus Christ. And most importantly, steer him in this life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to send him in the way that he should go because everything in him is going to pull him in the way that he would go, which is the wrong way. Today, our children have the potential to be awful. How much do you trust your children? I, I mean, honestly, I don't think we can. If we truly understand the nature of man and the, the, the doctrine of man, we can't even trust our own selves. And so we must bear that in mind when we're raising them. Is that given the opportunity, they'd probably lie to us. I did mine. So let's bear that in mind. It's going to affect how we raise our children. Another thing is, <laughs> contemplated not even mentioning it, but I'm very protective of mine. And it's not something that I do intentionally. Well, possibly so. But when you understand how awful men are, then you by nature want to try to protect them. <laughs> because you know what the world will do with them if you, let, if you leave them alone. The world will do everything they can to corrupt them. The world will hurt them. The world will tear them apart. If they can. And the devil's just waiting for one to be left alone. That he can lead astray. Some of the things that we find in the world. Some of the predators that we see. Are some of the people that we least expect. And it's a reality in the world that we live in. And it's not getting any better. I'm afraid quite the opposite. It's getting worse. And so we need to be very careful with our children to send them in the way that they should go, to protect them from the world and the world that seeks to destroy them right from the beginning. We live in a world that, honestly, is, I, I think that what you're probably going to see is you're going to see the world become more polarized as long as time is, is allowed to stand. And you're going to see a great polarization between those who truly know and serve God and those who do not. And I think this is probably one of the areas where we are at odds the most right now is how we raise our children. You know that the European Union has already said and declared that it is absolutely illegal for a person to corporally punish their children. And it could be the case that we see some of that eventually as well. But today, we've got to understand the nature of man. We've got to understand the doctrine of man in order that we could properly deal with man. Not only our children, not only the world outside, but even know how to deal with ourselves, that God could help us. But today, man is evil at heart. But the good news is, God can help us. And we can overcome through the Lord Jesus Christ while we have a verse of a song.